Chapter 13 In which Tom takes a trip As this story concerns Thomas Playfair and only incidentally the history of St. Mars, the reader will be spared the sad details concerning the night of the catastrophe and of the ensuing days of mourning. Tom, whom we have to do with, was conducted to the infirmary on Saturday morning by the doctor in person. Brother, he said to the infirmarian, here's a boy who's got to get complete rest for the next seven or eight days. Tom, who was standing behind the doctor and the infirmarian, smiled genially, raised his right leg, and, while balancing himself on his left, waved it spasmodically. Just look at him, continued the doctor, turning sharply and catching him in the act. He's trying to knock his burned leg against something even now. No, I ain't, protested the discomfited acrobat, bringing his foot to the floor. I'm not a fool. Whereupon he resumed his smile. The rogue knew that Harry Quip would be his companion. Of course, brother, pursued the man of medicine, you are to diet him. Tom's face fell. Diet me? With what, doctor? With a boat hook, answered the grave practitioner without showing the least sign of twinkle in his eye. He added in a lower tone to the infirmarian, Three pieces of toast and tea for breakfast, same for supper, with beef tea instead of tea for dinner. Tom overheard him. I say, he broke in, I'm not sick. I want to go to school and keep up with my class. You can't go out for a week, sir, and if you don't keep your legs quiet, I'll not let you go out for two weeks. Now remember, young fellow, no hopping over beds, no skipping, no jumping about the room, no running. When you have to walk, walk slowly. But the best thing you can do is keep perfectly quiet. Oh, pshaw! Tom was disgusted. Even Quip, jolly as ever, though battered, could not reconcile him to his imprisonment. Nor did he become reconciled as the days passed. After swallowing his toast, he was wont to seek out the infirmarian. Brother, he would say, I think I'm ready for breakfast now. I just brought it to you. What? You call that breakfast? Look here, brother, I'm paid for. The brother would answer with a grin, and Tom would turn away, growling. On Saturday of the following week, he received a letter which elicited a whoop from him. What are you howling about now? asked Quip, who, with the exception of a slight bruise and a touch of stiffness, was as well as ever. Read it yourself, cried Tom, tossing the letter to Harry and hopping about the room in an ecstasy of joy. Thus the letter ran. St. Louis, November 6th, 1893. Master Thomas Playfair. Dear son, have just heard from President of College fuller details of calamity and of your sickness. Here, too, that you have been changing for the better, got more sense, more faithful to your duty, study harder. Glad to learn, too, that you are brave, though far too reckless. Best of all, I am told that your company is good. Although President pronounces you quite well, he thinks that a few weeks' rest and change might be safe, as nervous shocks are likely to leave after effects. As I wrote you last September, your uncle has gone to Cincinnati, where, as he says, he is studying law. In a few days I shall be compelled to go there on business, and your aunt has made an engagement to see a friend there. Start for Cincinnati at once. We'll telegraph your uncle to meet you at the depot. Have advised President to procure you through ticket, and enclosed you twenty-five dollars for pocket money. Goodbye till we meet, and God bless you. Your father, George Playfair. At half-past two that afternoon, Tom, standing on the platform of the car, waved his handkerchief to his playmates as the train shot past the college. Kansas City was reached in fifteen minutes after scheduled time, and Tom, who had been counting for the last three hours on a grand lunch at the railroad depot, was obliged to hurry from his car to the Cincinnati train in order to make his connection. But here his forced patience was rewarded. "'Ladies and gents!' shouted a fat little man who seemed to be in a perpetual state of breathlessness. "'A dining car is attached to this train, and supper with all delicacies of the season is now served.' "'How much?' inquired Tom, catching the fat man's sleeve and fastening upon him one of the most earnest gazes the fat man had ever encountered. Seventy-five cents cash, without any chromo. Do you want to come in for half price? Do you take us for a circus?' The fat man was chuckling between each word. Pshaw! Is that all? 
Why, mister, I'd be willing to lay out five dollars on a square meal. You're going to lose on me this trip. I've got a whole week to make up for. Come right along, then, said the fat man. And Tom needed no second bidding. An African-American with an austere face and white apron moved a chair for Tom, and handing him the menu waited for the order. Tom's brows knitted as he read the bewildering list, a sort of macaronic, out of rhyme and meter. I say, couldn't you let me have a program in English of this entertainment? The African-American, changing his austere expression not one whit, rattled forth, Chicken roast or boiled, chicken salad, eggs fried, poached, boiled, omelette with jelly if preferred, beefsteak, lamb, mutton, chops, veal, ham, sausages, potatoes fried, boiled, Saratoga chips, tomatoes, raw, eggplant, baked beans, apple and custard pie, coffee, cream, tea, and bananas. That'll do, I think, said Tom. Fetch him in. The waiter changed expression. Fetch in what? Those things you were singing about. The waiter scratched his head. Look here said Tom, confidentially. I haven't had a square meal for a week. A doctor's been practicing on me till I'm nearly ruined. Now, you just go to work and give me lots to eat, get me a good square meal, and I'll give you fifty cents for yourself. There wasn't a sign of austerity on the African-American's face as he hurried away. Tom was served with a meal fit for a starving prince, and he did it justice. The African-American stationed behind him could scarce credit his eyes. Nothing equal to Tom's performance had ever come under his observation. Tom, ignorant of the admiration he had excited, plied knife and fork in a quiet, determined way, wishing in his heart that the doctor and infirmarian could see him. It would be sweet revenge. "'Come here,' whispered the waiter to one of his fellows. "'This young chap won't be able to get up. He'll bust!' However, after three quarters of an hour steady attention to the matter at hand, Tom arose quite calmly, whereupon the four waiters who had been viewing his performance from behind and expressing their wonder in dumb shows slipped quietly away, and, making a huge sign of the cross, returned thanks for his meal. "'I said my prayers after meals three times,' he remarked confidentially to the waiter, as he gave him one dollar and twenty-five cents, "'because I think I got in at least three suppers.' Tom ought to have been sick that night. He should have suffered intensely. The doctors and storybooks are at one on this point. All the same, he retired early and slept a dreamless sleep which lasted over nine hours. And if the recording angel put anyone on the blacklist for gluttony on that particular day, I am inclined to think it was the doctor and not the patient.